Um, I want to start by saying thank you to everyone that's here tonight to listen to me talk about um, my curation of the African Collection in Homecoming, our inaugural installation here at the New Stanley Museum of Art. I'm just so thrilled that it's actually here. Um, thank you also to Lauren, of course, for giving me this opportunity to do the work that I've done in this museum and to use nearly half of the galleries here to work with the African Collection. It's phenomenal and unique. I don't know of any other museums in the US that um, use so much space devoted to an African collection. So it's quite extraordinary to have that opportunity. And I also want to thank the Henry Reese Foundation for the support of Homecoming, um, of which my work here on the African collection is a part. I'd like to begin by um, showing a land acknowledgement um, by representatives of indigenous communities of Iowa. The University of Iowa is located on the homelands of the Ojibwe and the Anishinaabe, Bahoji, Iowa, Kickapoo, Kickapoo, Omatmanewak, Menominee, Miamika, Miami, Natuchi, Missouri, Omaha, Omaha, Wazaji, Osage, Jawer, Oto, Odawa, Ottawa, Ponca, Ponca, Potawatomi, Nishnabe, Potawatomi, Nishquaki, Nemahaki, Sakawaki, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, Sanish, Nubaga, Nueta, and the Ho Chunk Nations. The following tribal nations, the Omaha tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, Ponca tribe of Nebraska, Sac and Fox Nation of the Mississippi and Iowa, and Winnebago tribe of Nebraska continue to thrive in the state of Iowa, and we continue to acknowledge them. As an academic institution, it is our responsibility to acknowledge the sovereignty and the traditional territories of these tribal nations and the treaties that were used to remove these tribal nations and the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution since 1847. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Understanding the historical and current experiences of native peoples will help inform the work we do collectively as a university to engage in building relationships through academic scholarship, collaborative partnerships, community service, enrollment and retention efforts, acknowledging our past, our present, and future Native nations. Okay, I hope you could hear that even though you couldn't see it. So, I'll begin with this um, photograph of Hervé Yumbi's um, Bamaleke Dogon uh, mask for the Kungan Society. In African studies today, there is an old tension between two disciplines that continues to inform new modes of scholarship among writers, curators, and visual artists. And it's one that has guided my curatorial approach to the inaugural installation here at the Stanley Museum of Art. In academic terms, it's a tension between African art history and anthropology. And more specifically, it's an attempt to reconcile with colonial histories and epistemologies endemic to both. Roy Sieber was the first person in the world to earn a PhD in African art history at the University of Iowa in 1957. He trained many of America's first professors and curators of African art, including Christopher D. Roy, who taught African art here for nearly 40 years and curated many African art exhibitions for the museum. Roy would often uphold Sieber's claim that, quote, the distinction between the way an object is treated in anthropology and the way it's treated in art history is that in anthropology, any object will do if it's in the right class, category, or whatever. In art history, one deals with the object as the primary focus, and whatever you deal with must be used to explain that object." End quote. And that as an art historian, quote, you start with a work of art, you end with a work of art, 
but you can go anywhere in between, end quote. While this object-oriented mantra has become fundamental to the teaching mission of a university art museum, it does nothing to incorporate social justice, which centers diversity, equity, and inclusion, and representation before the value of the sanctified museum object. But don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting a relegation of the object, because the fact is that objects also have the power to do this work. It's not just something that happens through exhibitions and programs that surround them. Along with the visual beauty of Yumbing's mask, for example, which typically combines the work of five people, including Yumbi himself, and those who sculpt them from wood, cover them with beads, add their costume, and perform them within a masquerade. The power of Bamaleke Dogon Kungan mask resides in the fact that it interrogates the museum as a Western repository for the preservation of global cultural heritage. Each ensemble within the Visage de Mask or Faces of Mask series is in fact, or, or it includes a formal invitation to regularly loan the work back to Yumbi for ceremonial use in Africa. For those who decline, Yumbi proposes a sister mask that will be created to continue a parallel life in the ritual world. On this point, however, I disagree that those within museums are somehow beyond the ritual world. And I think that even the anthropologist, Horace Minor, would agree. While museums with Yumbi's masks have yet to accept this invitation, as a concept, it interrogates the museum as a contested terrain for the politics of representation, agency, ownership, preservation, and social engagement. Regarding ownership, Yumbi is not the first to invite museums to share their masks with indigenous communities. And his use of a sister mask as a replacement for those who decline the invitation evokes a similar set of circumstances involving a carved wooden hat at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History in 2013. During Zoe Struthers' presentation at the restitution debate, African Art in a Global Society, held on October 18th, 2019 at Columbia University, she recalled a question posed by Enid Schildkraut, former curator of the African collections at the MN NMNH, at the International Council of Museums Conference in 1997, when she asked, does Africa have anything to learn from NAGPRA? The question served as a precedent for the way in which NMNH staff worked with the representatives of the Klingit tribe of Alaska to create a duplicate for a killer whale crest hat repatriated to the indigenous community. And here you see um, the clan leader of the, the killer whale clan among Klingit peoples on the left. Um, his name is Edwell John Jr. working with Adam Matalo on the right who is a 3D program officer at the National Museum of Natural History, where they're scanning the mask in order to create a duplicate. And here you see uh, the duplicate mask or the crest hat on the left and the original on the right. Here's the duplicate on exhibit at the museum. And here are both crest hats performed in a ceremony at the museum by members of the Klingwick uh, tribe. And finally, here is um, a photograph of a uh, killer whale clan elder El Edwell John Jr. wearing the repatriated killer whale hat in 2013. Yumbi's invitation to loan his mask back to Africa for uh, regular ceremony ceremonial use is significant for several reasons. For museums that say no, it could be argued that the mask in the museum becomes the replica or surrogate for the quote unquote sister mask that remains part of art and life in Africa. And the pun here is intended. As a concept and a canonical paradigm used to teach African art history for decades at the University of Iowa and beyond, ALA is rooted in an anthropological approach to African art that centers upon ritual context as the foundation for learning about African art and culture. Visible signs of ritual use on an African object also function as typical criteria with which museums have determined authenticity in African art. And I share with you here the first guideline developed by Roy Sieber 
when he was the um, Associate Director of Collections and Research at the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art between 1983 and 1984, which reads, Works, work must have been used in a traditional context, whether ritual, ceremonial, or mundane. Work must reflect known use patterns through evidence of aging and patination. Conservation-related concerns regarding the changing condition of an African mask after repeated use, uh, repeated or use need to, need to accommodate the fact that many of the objects within museum collections are here in part because of a worn and weathered patina that signifies ritual use. Numbi's mask, in fact, was repaired in Cameroon after its performance and before it was shipped to Iowa. On the other hand, the Stanley Museum could partnered with UMB through public programs in Iowa while keeping the mask safely in one place inside the museum. On the other hand, an opportunity presents itself here for the Stanley Museum to partner with UMB on maintaining an ongoing performative role for the mask in Cameroon and with UMB's assistance on conservation of the mask if it requires any repair because of the loan. So here you see on the left a repair of the mask that's now on exhibit in about face upstairs. Um, this is Papa Frederick uh, Fijek, uh, um, who is um, a coiffure um, extraordinaire, the person that Hervé Yumbi works with specifically to attach um, the dreadlock costume that, that extends beneath the wooden portion of the mask. And on the right, um, a beater that he commonly works with, um, and her name is um, Mary Kwam. And this photograph is from Baham, Cameroon on the right in 2014. The mask here on the left with our mask in the museum is um, from 2019. What I love so much about Yumbi's mask is that it pushes the museum to reconsider not only the value of conventional stewardship practices, but also where the real agency lies with respect to the use of, per of a permanent collection in a public institution. In effect, Yumbi's invitation is a call for radical transparency within a museum and a call for radical change in the ways that they operate. It's with this, it is within this context that I pose the question in about face, African masks in Iowa, which re reads on the wall, how, mo how might these African masks allow us to re-envision the future of African art studies in Iowa? In my course of development for the inaugural installation at the Stanley Museum of Art, I've learned that the radical opacity is equally important in certain contexts. You will note, for example, that not a single historical object associated with the Royal Court of Benin is on display. Throughout my career in the museum world, institutional transparency has remained among the leading values with respect to teaching with the permanent collection. After reading Van Hick's book, sorry about that, Dan Hicks' book, The Brutish Museums, The Men in Bronzes, Colonial Violence and Cultural Restitution. And after reading Edouard Glissant's For Opacity, I realized the exhibition value of historical objects from the Benin Kingdom in Iowa is incommensurate with the loss, trauma, and violence that objects embody in relation to the British siege on Benin in 1897, in which the palace was burned and thousands of objects were stolen. The Stanley Museum is currently, currently working with a representative of the Court of Benin to return two objects in the permanent collection for which provenance information clearly demonstrates a link to the siege. And research continues on four others for which provenance remains incomplete. Sylvester Okunodu Obechi's book, Making History, African Collectors in the Canon of African Art, significantly informed my re reconfiguration of the galleries I had originally devoted to showing objects from Benin in the permanent collection. Obechi argues that African collections of African art in Africa have not been recognized as part of what constitutes the canon, and that we need to research more collections of African art in Africa in order to gain perspective on standards for collecting African art in the West. In reflecting upon the history of African art in Iowa, and the way in which the Stanley Collection of African Art has been used for decades as a standard for teaching, it occurred to me how little attention has been given to the collection of Dr. Meredith Saunders, who is the only, which is the only collection of African art in the museum created by a Black person. Dr. Saunders, born in Mason City, Iowa, 
earned his MD at the University of Iowa in 1956. You have Meredith Saunders there on the upper left. A year before Sieber completed his PhD in African art history in 1957. According to the Dr. Saunders archive, he began collecting African art while in Kenya in 1970, and while in the US, purchased additional works from dealers such as Merton Simpson, an important black American artist and dealer of African art in New York City, and also the Belgian art dealer, Mark Felix, both of whom were important art dealers for the Stanleys as well. Saunders first showed portions of his collection at the museum in 1981, and portions of his collection were gifted to the museum in 1986, 95, and 2017. None of it, however, was featured in the Art and Life in Africa project, which was arguably the most significant catalyst for canonizing African art in Iowa. In Fragments of the Canon, <clears throat> I pair many of the works from the Saunders and Stanley collections together, and I invite viewers to consider how Dr. Saunders' experience as a Black American in Iowa contributed to the development of his collection. I position the absence of his collection within the canon of African art in Iowa as a reason for its fragmentation. And by placing similar objects from both collections together throughout the exhibition, I invite viewers to explore the canonical standards of artistic quality and authenticity and what they meant for both collectors. So here, for example, we've got comparisons of objects created in the same style. Songhe objects on the left from the Stanley and the Saunders collections, Mosi style objects on the right from Saunders and Stanley collections. <clears throat> and I'll point out the fact that um, in consultations that I've led with scholars um, about these objects, you know, many, many questions remain to be answered. Um, this extraordinary staff in the form of a paddle on the right in the photo on the left from the Saunders collection is unlike anything that the world's preeminent, preeminent scholar on Songhe art, Dunya Hersak, has ever seen. Um, she's not even convinced that it's quote unquote authentic. Regardless of that you know, doubt of, of authenticity, it exhibits an extraordinarily beautiful patina and it belonged to Meredith Saunders as something important um, for his collection. And I show it immediately next to a Songhe style headdress for which the European provenance is quite robust um, and which conventionally um, confirms authenticity. And so um, throughout this exhibition, I pair objects in similar styles with various provenance information. And I invite you to reach your own conclusions about um, what, what sort of constitutes significance and quality um, among objects created by collectors in Iowa in the mid, in the mid 20th century. Um, here on the left are two Bobo style masks um, shown, uh, the, one, the one mask on the left was shown in African art from Iowa private collections here at the University of Iowa in 1981. Um, the mask immediately next to it on the right has only been shown once before. Um, these are absolutely fantastic, extraordinary works of art. Um, and they are a centerpiece in fragments of the canon. And immediately to the right, we have a Makonde style Ujama blackwood sculpture, um, which I am very, I think, comfortable with um, placing that acquisition as among the earliest in the Saunders collection. Um, this type of sculpture was very available on the marketplace in East Africa, where Saunders traveled in 1970. Um, and also, Saunders was a devout Catholic, and this scene, this crucifixion scene, you can see um, a Christ figure surrounded by figures, is very unusual for this type of object. But I think it's something that um, Dr. Meredith Saunders possibly identified with as a devout Catholic. And because of that subject matter within this work, it very likely was created in Tanzania outside the influence of a socialist regime in Mozambique that prohibited this kind of content in state-sponsored state artist workshops. Here are a couple of, of examples of masks from the Stanley collection um, acquired very early on um, and that were immediately um, classified as fakes or um, forgeries 
um, but at the same time, a very high artistic quality. And so you'll you'll see in the labels how um, previous museum staff and Max Stanley himself would qualify these objects in terms of authenticity and artistic quality and the sort of ideas that are involved in those judgments. In the Askin, in the Eskin Family Foundation exhibition cases, you'll find a selection of the museum's extensive African pottery collection, which stands as a monument to the creative work of women artists from the continent. Co-curated with Dr. Barema Diamatani, former director of the West African Museums Program, and a graduate from the doctoral program in art history here at Iowa, you'll find his written introduction and extended labels placed throughout the installation. In his text, Dr. Diamatani claims that, quote, in some regions of Africa today, pottery production is losing its aesthetic quality and ritual relevance, end quote. And he presents those in the current installation as a resource for further research on traditional ceramic practices in Africa and as a resource for in innovation among contemporary artists, which is exactly what we find at work in Guardian. Here on the far left, a sculpture commissioned by the artist Dante Hayes in 2021, and which is included in History is Always Now, an installation that is part of the inaugural exhibition. As part of this commission, made possible through generous support from Sharman Hunter, Hayes researched roughly a dozen pots from the African collection, including this Fra Fra style pot from Northern Ghana, immediately to the right of Guardian, in order to create this beautiful work that calls upon diverse sources of historical African art, European colonial history, and science fiction to celebrate Black American identity and African cultural heritage. Hay's greatest source of artistic inspiration is in fact Elizabeth Catlett, the first person in the world to get an MFA in studio art at the University of Iowa in 1940, six years before racial segregation ended on campus. As demonstrated in Fragments of the Canon, an ethos of social justice and racial equity applies equally to History as Always Now, in which I center work by African and Black American artists among objects from around the world with shared historical contexts, artistic strategies, and conceptual engagements. And at the same time, I provide an explicit departure from a, co a continental approach to African art and the culture area model that commonly attends it. In almost every constellation of objects within this exhibition, social justice and appropriation appear as central themes through which many artists visualize self-determination. By way of example, I call attention to Catlett's Which Way from 1973 on the right in relation to a Fang-style Ngontang mask from the Stanley Collection of African Art on the left. Both works of art represent young women looking in multiple directions at once, and the historical context for both works converge upon their ability to appropriate panoptic surveillance during colonial occupation in Gabon, on the one hand, and on the other, anti-Black racism in America. In Gontang, on the left, the name for Fang style, this Fang style mask derives from a, con a contraction of terms that mean face of the daughter of the white man. It was introduced during the 1920s in Gabon when it was still part of French equatorial Africa, where men used it in performances designed to counteract witchcraft and later to entertain the public after masks that performed a regulatory function in society were banned by the French colonial government. Catlett created Witch Way in 1973 while living in Mexico, and during which time she created many works in support of the Black arts movement in America. Throughout Catlett's work, we find the stylistic language of historical African art woven into her visionary aesthetic of Black power and self-determination. Facing left, right, and forward, the title of the work asks us which way, but as a visual analogy to her, who are, sorry, a visual analogy to her artistic and political engagements with the past, present, and future, the work is just as much about which time. Looking at this artwork today, following the, lives, following the rise of Black Lives Matter after the death of George Floyd and in the wake of related protests, 
that swept over the world, Catlitz Which Way confronts us as a confrontation with the past, present, and future, and it demands our recognition of how the division of temporal space in America remains subject to racist denials of historical accountability, where for some, pres the present rise of social justice is at best a passing fad, and where future prospects in America belong only to the privileged members of a meritocracy. Which way performs this, and it shines as a symbol of black resilience and solidarity gained through a convergence of the past, present, and future within herself. As a visual concept, it also forms a striking complement to the proverbial significance of Sankofa, which admonishes one to learn from the past in order to make progress in the future. So here are a few other examples of paired relationships in history as always now that reveal um, the political relationship between Erica J.T. Anang's uh, Mami Wata coffin in the background, uh, represented as a black woman in response to his participation in Black Lives Matter in Wisconsin around 2015, in response to our Mami Wata figure created in Nigeria um, by the artist um, Joseph Chukwu in the 1970s. Here I've foregrounded um, flowers by Andy Warhol to call attention to the extensive use of appropriation as an artistic strategy for many of the artists in this exhibition and how appropriation um, supports their expression of self-determination. Here, for example, we have um, Don Smith's uh, painted um, ceremonial backdrop, um, which is in fact, an appropriation of another work of art that he studied at the British Columbia Museum of Anthropology on the far right, far right not in our exhibition, but you can see um, nearly identical treatment. Um, I was delighted to, to get a question and also um, someone assumed that I made a mistake because in fact, this artist was born to a Cherokee mother in California, but was formally adopted by the um, Kwa Kwa Kiwak clan in the Pacific Northwest, where he became extremely proficient in this ovoid style that's characteristic uh, of indigenous art from the Pacific Northwest coast. So by birth, a Cherokee artist that has become an expert in art from the Pacific Northwest and embraced that identity and was formally adopted and named by the Kwa Kwa Kiwak clan Leluska. Um, so there is no mistake on the label. Um, he's born Cherokee, but worked uh, within the Kwa Kwa Kwak clan as um, a chief and uh, extraordinarily accomplished artist. Here on the left, we have Preston Singletary's Soul Catcher, which is in fact um, a deep engagement with historical examples of soul catchers created from bone and ivory, three of which on the right are in the British Museum collection collected in 1870. Um, so here again, um, Preston Singletary um, embracing his own indigenous um, identity and expressing self-determination through a very complex relationship with historical objects, indigenous objects that he transforms in terms of scale and material and um, creating it for a new audience. Returning to the theme of anthropology, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, I want to circle back to Yungi's work momentarily because on a conceptual level, it applies so broadly to my curation of the African collection throughout the inaugural installation. It's important to note that the extended label for Yungi's mask, as you see here on the right, was not written by me or any other curator for that matter. Yungi wrote it himself for two distinct discursive spaces art and anthropology. One label begins with the title of the object on the top you see there on the far right, followed by the name of the artists and the cultural context for the mask in Africa. The other begins with the name of the individual artist, Yumbi, followed by a description of the way in which the work performs an institutional critique. Yumbi's prioritization of the quote unquote anthropological label above the quote unquote art label might be viewed as arbitrary 
but the sophistication of his work suggests otherwise. The last two lines of his text, for example, reveal the extent to which his first voice becomes a straw man for the second, in which the artist has, quote, adopted the ethnographer's role of, quote, participant observer, end quote, to record his object being performed by a Kungan society member, end quote. The, perform the performative aspect of Yumbi's role as ethnographer is key to his unveiling of Kungan rituals in Cameroon and curatorial rituals in the museum. The hyphenated use of two ethnonyms in the title of Yumbi's work toys with the one tribe, one, tile, one style paradigm in African art studies about which scholars have been suspect for about 100 years and which nevertheless remains retains validity for those who believe that one can use artistic style and other material conditions to determine ethnic attribution, even when African provenance is thin or absent, or when the artist's name is unrecorded. The importance of this stylistic hybridity in Yumbi's work is not that it is in any way unprecedented, but on the contrary, it is contiguous with the shared histories of artistic pra practice in Africa. His hyphenated title for the work calls attention to, the, to this directly, and it points to the limits of the ways in which any single ethnonym, such as Lobi, Yorba, Luba, and so on, has the capacity to meaningfully represent stylistic complexity for any given object. In this respect, my decision to use ethnonyms on objects uh, labeled as a stylistic reference rather than as an attribution for the artist's assumed identity, remains provisional. A provisional solution toward the larger goal of abandoning colonial era assumptions about a supposed fixed relationship between artistic style and the artist's ethnic identity. <clears throat> In History is Always Now, the relationship between Willie Cole's Men of Iron and the installation of the J. Richard Simon collection of Yorba Twin Figures provides another example of this curatorial goal, which is to center examples of African art from, this, from the permanent collection to highlight the complexity of relationships between artistic style and identity and the way in which this relationship appears in anthropological and art historical discourse. Cole uses the faded black and white aesthetics of an early 20th century textbook on social science and its standard use of photographic techniques that at once objectify and dehumanize subjects within the anthropological gaze. Ritual attire for the quote unquote silex male, according to this type, features a tripartite headdress made of iron forms that complement tattoo patterns found throughout the body. Ceremonial, att ceremonial attire for the quote unquote sunbeam male features a mask and costume composed of the same form a domestic hot iron, a common motif in a lot of Cole's work that satirizes the objectivity of the anthropological gaze, even as it belongs to an art history of repurposing objects throughout Africa. And in terms of material, Ogun, known throughout the African diaspora, not only as the god of iron, but war as well. And the violence evoked by this association is indelibly linked to the anthropological colonial gaze that, go, that Cole appropriates in this artwork. Cole's aesthetic strategies in Men of Iron complements ways in which the J. Richard Simon collection of Yorba twin figures is organized stylistically in a serial fashion. Multiple numbered viewed views of the silex and sunbeam types are lined up like the era abeji adjacent to them, arranged into stylistic categories such as Oyo, Egba, Igbo Mina and Baba Magba, as you see here on the left. On the one hand, I chose to use this method of display for the Simon collection to encourage the recognition of subtle artistic differences among objects that are otherwise quite similar. On the other hand, the same stylistic groupings call attention to regional subcategorizations of Yorba art formalized by William Buller Fagg, former curator and later keeper in the Department of Ethnography at the British Museum from 1938 to 1974, and one of the most notorious defenders of tribality in African art. For many years, he's been roundly and rightly criticized by many for the one tribe, one style approach presented in his 1965 book, Tribes and Forms in 
African art, which canonized a colonial era anthropological paradigm that contemporary artists such as Cole and Yumbi continue to par parody and interrogate today. At the same time, I want to discourage the idea that this kind of institutional critique is exclusive to contemporary artists privileged by the power of hindsight to rewrite the past through strategies of appropriation that permeate many of the works in history as always now. To conclude, I will end with what I conceived of as a threshold for viewing the African collection placed among galleries that occupy nearly half of this museum. Centering on cloth, the art of African textiles features a collection of absolutely stunning works of art with materials, motifs, and techniques embedded in a complex history of global exchange. The global context that surrounds the creation of these textiles sets the tone for the broader theme of social justice at work in adjacent galleries and to the ways in which histories of African art in Iowa reaches beyond rituals on the continent. Thank you. So I think we have some time for Q&A. Happy to chat with you about anything you'd like. Sure, hi. Summarize your take home message. Take home message. So um, my approach to the African collection is um, in direct conversation with the history of use of African art in Iowa, which is predominantly anthropological in terms of methodology, where objects are presented as types, as illustrations, as passive objects of culture. Um, my approach as an art historian um, privileges each object as an individual work of art associated with a person um, that does not represent an entire, an entire culture group just by way of, you know, matter of fact, um, you know, it's an assumption that, that is particular to the history of anthropology where objects are passive illustrations of cultural groups in Africa. And so what I've done with this, this installation is to focus on um, the objects and artistic relationships within objects created in Africa, but also in relationship to objects throughout the world to tease out interpretations that don't belong to that very sort of insular history of interpretation where ritual context is, is the source of meaning um, by showing works of art such as the fang mask in relation to you know catlet's which way you can talk about the global history of colonization not only in terms of european colonization of africa but race politics in america between you know, Anglo-American colonial settlers and Black Americans, and how Catlett's appropriation of African art embraces her cultural African heritage. You're not going to get those kinds of global perspectives by focusing on rituals in Africa. So um, I've attempted to broaden the scope to place the African collection in a global context. Historically, people collected African art from anthropological standpoint. Sure. And uh, as you said, I agree that uh, the important thing is the visual impact, mm. the emotional content of it, regardless of whether it was used for ritual or not. Something that's used for ritual but not, not, not emotional, it's like, I don't think that's good enough. And, but historically, that was the way African art were collected. By anthropologists. And I was struck by one piece of your collection, and that was the Makandi uh, sculpture. Those were not used for rituals, so they were created by non artists for commercial purposes, they sold in the market. And in fact, I had one piece of that that I collected some 40 years ago, and I collected it because of its special impact. And I agree with you that, uh, that this would be the trend, not just uh, strictly from an anthropological point of view. And, uh, so, so I'm glad you picked up on that. You collected that later. <laughs> <laughs>
kind of imprisoned. Yeah. That, same way. Yes, I mean, that's the centerpiece of Fragments of the Canon. It's extraordinary, it's unusual, and it falls outside the conventional sort of standards for you know, quality and, and authenticity in African art. I mean, the fact that it represents a crucifixion scene um, and the fact that it was actually, it belongs to a, um, artist workshops that were sponsored by socialists in Mozambique um, after colonial independence. Um, you know, those kinds of, that kind of patronage does not belong to the canon. And so to show that as a centerpiece and fragments of the canon is, is there to intentionally, you know, reveal that tension, you know, surrounding objects that historically belonged to these contexts of ritual and yes. There's a trend in Africa nowadays <laughs> that uh, professional artists creating more modern style of art, but not related to the rituals, and they're doing quite well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. What are your plans to develop the current collection? And do you plan to include some of the contemporary artists from the other countries? Yes, um, I think I, well, here's a great example of what I'm doing. Um, on the left, we have um, Rouge Kente et Monde, um, a, a textile by the contemporary artist Abdoulaye Konate that lives and works in Bamako, and with whom I had the pleasure of spending time in Dakar and in Accra over the summer. Um, he is one of the world's most important contemporary artists, period. And I was able to acquire one of his works for the museum um, within the last year. And so I'm very excited to focus on contemporary work because we have such a strong historical collection. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love, I absolutely love historical African art. I'm also um, exhausted by the, the tension that's embedded in it in terms of the colonial history and, you know, sussing out the ethics in terms of where and when it should be and why. Um, and what I love about contemporary African art is that it brings a living voice into the conversation. And, you know, in, in Abdoulaye Konate, Konate's work, he, he again, there's strategies of, of appropriation um, throughout these works of art that celebrate um, self-determination. And in this work of art, Abdoulaye Konate is using um, dyeing techniques that are indigenous to Mali, and he's appropriating strips of kente cloth that originate from Ghana, and he's using it in a format that recalls Rothko. And there's this rich global complexity of sources that you also see at work in artists like Dante Hayes. So getting back to my point, my, my plans, um, as are stated in our, in our collections plan, is to focus on the work of emerging artists from the continent and also emerging um, artists of color in America um, so commissioning Dante Hayes, acquiring work from Abdoulaye Konate, who is granted a more senior artist. He's born in 53, so he's not a spring chicken. Um, but I have acquired work also. Yeah. Well, hey. <laughs> um, so I've, I've acquired contemporary work by um, Taye Itohor, who was born in the 80s. So I guess we can call her a spring chicken. Um, Erika J.T. Anang, he's in his 30s, um, and he's in history as always now. Um, Hervé Yumbi, um, the artist that I talked a lot about tonight, he's a, a contemporary artist that's doing wonderful things all over the world. Um, Wangechi Mutu, a recent acquisition of her work is upstairs, Peiji Laiwola. Um, so long story short, um, I, I'm attempting to shore up the contemporary collection because we have such a rich historical collection and the most exciting opportunity for me as a curator is when I'm able to commission artists to create work in dialogue with our collection like Dante did and like Eric did, um, because there's a really special relationship between that object and this collection. Um, same with Odita, Odita's mural. Um, you know, this, this forms a very special relationship, not only with our collection, but with Iowa. Um, you know, he has a personal collection to this place. So when there's an opportunity to, to commission artists to make something about this place, um, you know, that is part of our collection plan as well. Oh, I think we're out of time. Oh, we have 12 minutes, right? Oh, 7.45. Sorry, we got to cut it. Okay. <laughs>
Um, well, thank you everyone so much. I'll take one more question, please. You mentioned digitization when you showed it to masks. Yeah. Um, does digitization you mean? It seems like it could be done for very positive reasons and it could be done for very negative reasons. For sure. Does this change the uniqueness of art if we could just easily reproduce it? I think it's all about context. And in this case, you know, the the elder of the killer whale clan. Um, endorsed the dig digitization and replication of a mask. Um, so there was, you know, that 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 indigenous endorsement of that digitization is what I think um, empowers that particular project. And, you know, there's a complementary project at work um, within which curators and scholars and representatives of the Edo community in Nigeria are involved in the Digital Benin Project, which is a digitization of all of the works looted from the, the siege of 1897 to then use those objects and exhibit them at the new museum in Benin. So um, I think that when source communities are involved related to the objects that are being digitized, that level of endorsement, I think condones that kind of activity. Because price was often based in millions of dollars on the uniqueness, let's say, Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa or uh, Michelangelo's David. And even paintings like uh, the one dressed in um, the Sistine Madonna. It's not that I think that the price would change, but it's so readily available for the market. Because sure. its uniqueness is now gone. I think that's when people get into the politics of authenticity, as long as people know the original. Um, but if the questions are there, you're right. You know, that, that does affect market value. Yeah. Thank you for your question, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.